Art is a very subjective thing. The way we dissect it, the way we create it. In many ways, artists are the foundations of the universe. We're the ones that spread joy, happiness, inspire others to do something with their lives when they were previously too scared to. So what happens when art is used selfishly to demean, to outmaneuver? What if art was made in retaliation of someone being better than you? Well, what if I told you that art was still valid? Yes, art made in hatred, coded in malice, is still as viable and special as art created in love. But it's important to not lose sight of the very people your art has connected you to by sticking with that malice. Look back smaller scale allows me to relate to a work by Fujimoto more than I ever could. So, it's all the more heartbreaking that instead of allowing yourself to dissect your own relationship with your hobbies and how healthy or unhealthy that relationship may be, you instead choose to indulge in Hori's terrorism again. The My Hero movies want to have it both ways. It wants to fit itself into the canonness of the main series, while also wanting to have the freedom that a non-canon story would have. I mean, one of the movies was literally a draft ending for the series. A much better ending if you ask me, Deku doesn't end up as a Sneeko and Chibi clone, but because it's trying to do both, it's not only handicapping itself in the way it can explore the main show, but also has spectacle that in no way would fit into the timeline without drastic concessions. I would call this being too ambitious, but as you're about to see, these movies are anything but. Whereas the first one had the spectacle of seeing your favorite characters in a different setting than normal, the second one had an overpolished, chaotic nature thanks to Yuki Hayashi overseeing most of it, the third one had honest to god pretty decent choreography and a cute enough story, the fourth one lacks pretty much everything that could set it apart. From what I recall from the credits, the series chief director, Nagasaki, is nowhere to be found. And obviously, the woman responsible for the best looking MHA season since season 2 is too busy recreating manga panels. And it shows, as the usual flair that My Hero Academia offers to its audience is gone. And keep in mind, that flair was never that impeccable to begin with. It honestly dissipates in the face of MHA's contemporaries. The anime doesn't expand on the choreography found in the manga, nor does it make up for that in outstanding directorial input. Because of the demographic MHA appeals to, it isn't really allowed to be as experimental as any other show, because of the committee, allegedly. Even though that committee talking point kinda goes out the window as soon as MHA's worst arcs have to be adapted, but whatever. And while it's acceptable in most areas, MHA Your Next lacks a good visual identity. Identity that at least sort of justified the other three movies' existence. My Hero Academia Your Next is about a crime family abducting a teenager that can amplify quirks. This premise is actually pretty interesting since Hiroaka is based on western comic books, and one of the most prolific tropes of those comic books is the conflict of heroes and crime lords, people that the police can't just arrest because the structure of the very streets would be in jeopardy, or those same streets have the police in their pocket. You add this onto the premise that this kingpin is inspired by one of the most altruistic heroes of all time, and you have a really good foundation for an original story. Unfortunately, just like the other three in this franchise, the movie doesn't capitalize on its premise and instead just uses it as an excuse to have action set pieces. Only this time, the action set pieces aren't even as good as the other three. The cast is just as incompetent as they are in the manga, never really succeeding, doing nothing of substance, and yet they take away screen time of the characters you actually came here to see. Psst, so the usual, I guess. And don't get me wrong, in order for the plot to progress they need to be here. Because Deku, the MC, makes terrible decision after terrible decision, is constantly getting slapped around like an idiot, and his existence as a mouthpiece is called into question because when the character rightfully tells him he's getting involved in a situation he doesn't understand the depth of, he has nothing of interest to say in response. He doesn't have anything of interest to say when someone impersonates his idol either. All he does is shout, you're not the real All Might, while not contending with why that might be. 
And this isn't really his fault, because the story doesn't make use of the fact that a good nature plea for the next generation has been twisted into something that justifies power hunger. So much so that when Dark Might is called out by his idol, he acts unbothered by it and proceeds to business as usual. Because that's how people act when the person they admire most reject their life's work. The excuse was always, you don't go to these types of movies for the plot, you go for the impressive animation. But if both of them suck, why am I here? Why did I waste two hours of my life on the same day I could have been playing Sonic X Generations? I could have played Radical Highway ten times over with that amount of time. The manga's over, and the anime is about to end. Why couldn't Bones just wait to make a movie that actually helps us all with the passing of the series, instead of this cash grab that doesn't really even fit in the timeline? I would say it's for the money, for the love of the game, but if you saw this movie, at least in the West, then you know how empty the theaters were. They're not making shit off of this. At least this movie doesn't have any disastrous power scaling implications like the last two, cause... Ugh, Lord have mercy. It's no secret that these days, when it comes to shonen movies, canon adaptations have taken priority. Story content comes with an incentive to really reel in a large audience, and success tends to follow. After Demon Slayer's massive blowout, tons of other studios have wanted their shows to follow in its footsteps, with anime like Spy X Family, which literally just came out a couple of seasons ago, getting the same treatment. This isn't anything new. Movie adaptations of manga and light novels have always existed, from the widely acclaimed romantic drama Silent Voice to even older Ghibli works. However, there is a major trade-off when it comes to this. For one, if you're anything like The Silent Voice, which is adapting a whole entire series of stories, you're bound to either need to put important or even interesting plot details on the cutting room floor, or even skip entire sections entirely. If you're adapting one arc specifically, then it can lead to unintentional loose ends, or in general, odd pacing choices like seen in Volume Zero. Volume Zero is actually a big victim of this, as many fans have stated that the JJK movie feels like one long episode as opposed to a proper film. Secondly, when you do choose a movie to have a canon adaptation, the manga becomes your script rather than ingenuity, which can really strip the process of a lot of cool exclusive ideas outside of the directing. Black Clover's movie being original proves that original ideas still have a place within the modern industry, with not only showing previous Wizard Kings that stick close to the series themes, but also with once in a lifetime team ups. The creativity with the new magic types for the movie characters, as well as the cliche movie original power up, is what makes these movies feel right at home for the medium. The classic shonen movie formula is something that One Piece has been able to capitalize on with its many movies over the years. I haven't seen all the one Piece movies, but from the wacky mind-bending Baron Amatsuri in The Secret Island to the riches and absolute drip from film gold, One Piece thrives on its creative ideas in such a massive world where almost anything can work. The series prides itself on so many creative concepts from its devil fruit power system to unpredictable character designs, and each movie takes advantage of that foundation to introduce new creative stories that don't interrupt the main story. Each of these movies typically taking place between a pair of arcs, which allow the constant evolution of the art style and animation practices to keep up with it. Alongside this, as the main story goes on and new developments are introduced, the movies are able to play off them in a fun way that makes the ride nothing short of a fun time. The latest two movies manage to do this with not only a slew of team-ups and character inclusions from the main series with lore-driven moments, but with also nods that emphasize certain moments of characterization. Film Stampede manages to present this formula quite well with a pirate festival that has a little bit of every faction present. The marines and admirals, revolutionary army members, warlords, and the most we are probably gonna get of the new generation all being in one place. The antagonist being a pirate from Roger's era, giving lore nerds something to talk about, while also giving power scalers a field day with this fight against the new generation. The film is probably the most fan service One Piece has ever gotten, with unpredictable team ups that I'm sure nobody had even dreamed of. There will never be a situation in the main story that will allow somebody like Smoker to work with Sabo, and yet because this movie does its own thing, it takes those unrestricted creative boundaries and experiments with them. Who would have thought to see Zoro fight Fushitora after years of fans hoping for it, or even Boa Hancock work together with Law? Out of the hundreds of characters in the series, the movies take a couple dozen and provides all sorts of unique interactions, exchanges, and encounters that would not be allowed within something like a canon movie. Original ideas allow the best types of what-ifs to take shape, and while Stampede does this in an action-packed way, Film Red takes this idea even further with its inclusion of an idle story. One Piece is full of all sorts of characters that pride themselves on all sorts of professions, and the inclusion of the idol Uta was another iteration of that. Connecting her story to the man Shanks himself was also a great way to give the red hair beast some more screen time, considering he's rarely in the anime. Film Red by far was not nearly as epic as Stampede, but it went a different direction with creating a musical. It greatly helped that the famous Japanese artist 
Otto helmed all the music, creating a track of flawless songs which stayed in tune with Uta's character. You were able to feel and understand the story Uta was trying to tell through her music and also recognize the spiral she was going down as the movie went on. The movie was also able to show more of the type of man Shanks is, willing to take on the burden of crimes and hatred and silence even if they were the genuine heroes. Fan service still manages to make its way into the film with Big Mom Pirates cooperating with both the Red Haired and Straw Hat Pirates. The best part, however, was seeing Usopp and his dad working together after it being established that his father left years ago and was a part of Shanks' crew this entire time. While the final battles of the series may have them fighting against each other, the movie served as a gateway to have them collaborate via observation hockey and that easily is worth a different approach the movie took. One Piece doesn't necessarily pride itself on movie original power-ups and instead utilizes its growing cast in such creative ways across various different situations and settings that makes these movies never get old. It's important to note that anime movies will never go away. If your series obtains even a fraction of success its contemporaries do, you can for sure expect an OVA or a film at some point. It's been this way for series like Naruto, Evangelion, Madoka Magica, or even Bleach. However, original ideas are always going to be what really open the gates for all sorts of possibilities as time goes on. A lot of anime movies nowadays just feel needless. The amount of times a manga reader has been excited for an arc they love to be adapted, only for it to be announced that it will be sliced and diced just to fit the confines of a theatrical release, is boundless. Even if these movies are good, nothing can compare to the experience of having a weekly anime to discuss, as the studio takes their proper time with the adaption. So what's the solution? The best method is to not just make an original story, but a meaningful one. One that even takes certain franchises, places we've never seen, in ways that the OG material never had time for. Or adapt a story that would never fit into a full-length show. Give one-shots and lesser-known manga the opportunities to shine like you used to. That's just if you're going the canon route. If not, go wild. Your only limit is your imagination at that point. There's beauty to be had in Elseworld stories. But I think the most important thing to realize when you're going to pick what type of anime movie you're gonna be is this. You have to pick one!